I'd like you to turn them, please, to the book of the Revelation. And uh, y'all might want to turn that uh -huh. microphone down just a little bit. I'll get uh, it's plenty loud. Revelation, and uh, I'd like you to turn to uh, chapter 19. And uh, for the last several weeks, we have been talking about um, the wrath of God and uh, why the wrath of God comes. And the Bible says it comes on the children of disobedience. We talked last week about pouring out of the vials of wrath. And uh, so that you don't think that I skipped over it, uh, chapter 17 and chapter 18 uh, in the book of Revelation, um, it kind of summarizes everything um, that is wicked uh, upon the earth and uh, how that, and something for you all to keep in mind before I get into chapter 19. One of the things that you're going to see uh, more and more, and I know that we see a little bit of it now in our, our country, and uh, we think that it's, you know, really bad because in our country right now you can be about any kind of religion that you want to be and get by with about anything you want to get by with unless you're a Christian. And if you're a Christian, then, you know, you can't take your Bible anywhere. Uh, they don't want the Ten Commandments anywhere. I heard on the news today where there is somebody in Akron, Ohio, that has filed a lawsuit against the federal government, and they want In God We Trust taken off of our money. Now... I'd like to point out something before I get too deeply engrossed into this. Um, you know, our country was founded on religious liberty, and uh, the people that founded our country did so because they wanted to be able to worship God freely. And uh, as for me and my house, we're going to trust in Him, whether it's in our money, whether it's in our schools, He's still going to be God. So, But in these last days as they come, um, I, something I want you all to keep in mind. The hatred, and I do mean hatred, for God's people is going to increase. There is going to be a, an intense polarity. And it's going to be everybody else, and then it's going to be the Christian. Right now, we kind of got a, a middle of the road. There will no longer be that middle of the road. Jesus said, because the world has hated me, it will hate you also. And there will come a time when God's people, because they stand for God, will be hated of the world. Sometimes it will be our families. Sometimes it will be the folks that we think that are our friends. But in chapter 17 and 18 of the book of Revelation, you find the representation of all things that are evil, and there is a polarity that takes place there. So there's not going to be a place for those that are middle of the road. Jesus told the to church of Laodicea, I would that you were either hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, what is lukewarm? Right in the middle. Because you're middle of the road and you're not hot or cold, he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He didn't want anything to do with it. The thought process there is if they're cold, they're going to want to get hot. And if they're hot, they're serving the Lord anyhow. But what I want you to understand, it is going to get exceedingly difficult uh, before the end comes uh, for God's people and for those that are, are called by the name of Christ. <laughs> now, uh, again, uh, I'd like to say, and, and, and I know that when I say this openly, it's going to go out on the airways. And that's okay too. Uh, but as for me and my house, and as for me and this church, we are going to serve the Lord. Amen. We, you know, there there will not be a backpedal there. And I know uh, that there are going to be some folks that will come against that. But that's okay too. Uh, the Lord said He'd see us through. And so everything that I've taught you to this point uh, is about where the church is supposed to position itself. And I believe that we ought to position ourselves right behind the Lord. Wherever He leads us, we'll follow. Whatever He says to preach, I'll preach it until you all either 
line up behind me or throw me out of the door, whichever the case may be. So, uh, Revelation chapter 19. I begin to read in verse 1. And uh, I, I don't know how much of this I, I'm trying to get through this series. I don't know how much of it I'll get through tonight. But in Revelation chapter 19, in verse 1, it says, After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. You want to underline in your mind or in your Bible the last part of that first verse because it says, Unto the Lord our God. So when we look at this, I think it's pretty clear at this particular junction in time that the church is in heaven. Because he is Lord and he is God. In verse 2, the proclamation is made, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God and sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And in verse 5 it said, A voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him both small and great. Now, let me stop before I get down to this next part because when I get to this next part is probably when it's going to slow me down. But let me tell you what's <laughs> taking place in these first six verses of chapter 19. There is a praise and worship service that's taking place in heaven. Now, I, I think, and for a while now, I've been telling you all that, that we need, when we come in here, we need to focus our hearts on worshiping the Lord. Um, these folks, when they get to heaven, they don't. They, it doesn't take anybody to get happy for them to get happy. It doesn't take anybody else to shout for them to shout. It doesn't take anybody else to say amen for them to say amen or hallelujah or praise God or praise our Lord or, you know, the things that God is doing and has done is enough for them to praise God. So I wonder whether or not if we're looking at where the church should position itself, should we not, when we come to the house of God, whether it's on Wednesday night when the weather is bad or whether it's on Sunday, whether it's on Friday, should we not enter into his course with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips? Yeah. I mean, so it, it, we shouldn't have to work it up. We ought to just be happy that he's our father, that he's our God, that he saved us, and that no matter how bad that it gets, there's still going to be some that are going to get together and worship the Lord. Now, let me, let me get to this next part because I've been waiting a long time to get right here. In verse 7, he starts out again. He said, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now, uh, some asked me last week when we talked about the wrath of God and the outpouring of the wrath of God, um, you know, what I thought as far as the church was concerned, and I made this statement. I believe that during the outpouring of the wrath of God that this section of Scripture is where the church is going to be. Now, I don't know how long that's going to take. don't know how long that the marriage supper is going to take. I've read about some of the things that are going to happen there. Brother Kyle sings a song uh, about the marriage supper and about saving me a seat at the table. And, and all of those things are well and good. But what I want you to understand that I believe that during the marriage celebration, and, and by the way, I do not think that the marriage celebration in heaven is going to be a small thing. Huh? I mean, when you think about it, Mike said he wouldn't think so. But, I mean, have you all ever really tried to envision what it's going to look like? I, I, and I don't mean 
just when you read or if you try to compare it to, you know, when we have a wedding here and it's all done up at the finery and we decorate the building and, you know, we decorate the men so they can look as best they can. And, and then the women, of course, they're always, you know, outstanding. Uh, and, you know, hey, this is going out on the airway, but I'm smarter than that. But that's where I got poured on. But, but here's the thing. Uh, have you ever tried to visualize what the actual coronation and, I, you know, and I'm simple. When it talks about a marriage supper, in order for there to be a marriage supper, there must be a marriage. Okay? Now, again, I'm kind of simple. But in order to have a marriage, as I understand it, both in the Jewish custom and in our custom, <clears throat> There must be a bride and there must be a groom. Okay? And we are the bride. The church is the bride of Christ. Can you go back there and see if you can find that YouTube thing that you sent me today uh, on the computer? And uh, it'll be worth it in a little while. I know I interrupted my thought process right in the middle, but I meant to do that earlier and I forgot about it. Uh, here's the thing. When you visualize, all of heaven, first of all, is going to be a guest at this celebration. All of it. All of them that have gone on to be the Lord, all of the Old Testament prophets that prophesied about the things that would come, all of that, all creation will be a part of that, and yet... When you look here, and, and, and if you all miss this, um, you really need to get your feeler fixed. Because here's the thing I want you to understand. First six verses is praising the Lord, is praising the Father, giving glory to Him. But in verse 7... The focus of everything changes. And it says, let us rejoice and give him honor for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Now, what is taking place in this verse is that at this moment of time, and, and, and again, I, I just, I know this how we do it. I don't know they always do it. But normally... When we have that song that they play, Here Comes the Bride, and they open up the church doors, and everybody in the sanctuary stands up, and they turn around, and their entire focus is, for that moment is on the bride. I think the same thing going to happen in heaven. I think, I don't know how it's going to happen, but somehow, I believe that the attention of all of glory in this verse is focused on the church because we are the bride of the Son of God. And so the scripture says the marriage is come and then I want you to pay particular close attention to this because I'm going to ask a question. And it says and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, let me ask you a question. How, when you picture this, if this wife of the Lamb, the, the bride of Christ, hath made herself ready, what do you think is going through his mind? Have you ever considered it? What's going through his mind right now? Have you ever considered it? Think about it. What did he tell him? I am going away to prepare a place that where I am, there you may be also. So, whatever he's doing today, I don't think that He's just sitting up there waiting on the Father to say it's time to go get the church. I think he's making preparation 
for verse 7. And I think that when he's making preparation, now, some of you young fellas, <clears throat> some of us old fellas, can still remember when we caught a glimpse of our bride coming down the aisle and the many things, and I got to tell you, and I still am, my wife asked me last week, she looked over at me and she smiled because she wanted something. <laughs> no, no, I understand. It's okay to laugh. She, she just looked over at me. She never said anything. She just smiled. And I look at her when she smiled like that. She said, does my smile still woo you? <laughs> now, we've been married for almost 34 years. But I got to tell you, when she smiles at me, it still does. And so it's like, okay, you know, what do you want? You know, where she come across something on Pinterest or Facebook, or one of them things that somebody sent her said, hey, your husband need to make you one of them, whatever it was, it doesn't matter. But my point is, when I look at her, there is still that magic moment in my heart that I realize that God has given me her. I want you to get that. Because that's what this is talking about. You see, it hasn't that it's been easy for the church, for the bride, to wait. And it hasn't been that it's been easy for the Lord to wait. And no doubt in eternity, and I, I don't know whether there's days in eternity, or well, I know the Bible says that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years. I know all of that. But I just gotta wonder whether or not that as he is preparing whatever he is preparing if his mindset isn't on this verse and thinking about what the bride is going to have to go through to make herself ready and what the bride in her fullness and her completion now let's think about how many of y'all have been in a good church service every Sunday Thank you, sissy. You did really good. I'm right back there and record that. How many of y'all have been in a great church service? How many of y'all ever been in one of them church services you didn't want to go home from? Yeah. Yeah. And that's just a church service with a group of people that are worshiping our Savior. Now think about this. You take all of the Christians, which are part of that bride, and you put them all together in a church service in heaven. I told, I told you it was going to get good up here. I know that I've got a vivid imagination, but can you imagine, first of all, we're going to realize we don't ever have to go home, because we are. Hold that thought about 10,000 shouting years. Because we may. But not only that, can you imagine? I don't know how it's all going to happen. But can you imagine how it's going to be for the church when the object of our affection that we praise on this side and we worship on this side and we sing to on this side and we preach to on this side can you imagine how it's finally going to be for us when we get to that side? I don't, I don't know how it's going to be. I've got a notion I won't have to worry about keeping on my shoes. <laughs> but when you look at this, the scripture here says, let us rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And when I read that, what that tells me is this has been hard fought. This is not just a moment in eternity. But this is something that has been waited on from eternity past to now. And you say, well, no, listen, the Bible says 
that before the foundation of the world, he made a way for this to happen. And this verse says it's finally here. Now, I don't know what it's going to be like on both sides of that. I don't know. But I can tell you that in the first six verses, they're shouting the glory of God and they're praising God. And in verse 7, all of a sudden, the bride comes in. Now, if there was a shouting time in heaven before that, and because I know how it is now, because I'm the preacher, so I get to stand up here and I watch all of you all when you're watching them and the bride comes in and everybody goes, Isn't she lovely? Uh -huh. She is. Hmm. But not anything like this. I I'm telling you, it's altogether different. So when he talks about this, he says the marriage of the Lamb is come. His wife hath made herself ready. And watch this. And to her it was granted. Now what's the word granted mean? Permitted. Permitted? Given? Okay. So she was given permission to? Can we take both of those words and put them together? She was given permission. Now watch this. To her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, here's what I want you to get out of that. Here's, I, I, when I think about this, what I see... This is, this is a garment that nobody else could wear. It is, if you will, it is the wedding garment. It is the one that gives us the ability to permission because it tells us what it is. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, here's what I want you to touch it now. I know we only got a few in here tonight, but you all ready to shout? Because I want you to see this. It does not say, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not what it said. It says that it is the righteousness of saints. Now, the Bible teaches us that our righteousness is as filthy rags and that we are clothed in His righteousness. Now, watch this. <clears throat> what happens here? is the bride literally is wrapped or dressed in the righteousness of her Savior. I, I, so, I mean, when you think about the magnitude of that, and, and, I, and again, I don't know how it's going to happen in heaven because I try to get it in my peanut brain and I can't even describe the way I'm seeing it. If I could get out of my mind, into my mouth, out to you all what I'm seeing in my head right now, it would scare you. I promise you that it would. But when I think about this, when we think about how hard, and I, I told somebody the other day, if, if, if the devil, if, if this thing's not real, why in the world is the devil trying so hard to keep us from it? Now watch this want you to see and he said unto me write blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb now let me ask you a question when you think about and, and we do I suppose and maybe this is where we get it we set up a uh uh, what do they call that? The table where the wedding party sets at. Isn't there a name for that table? Head table. Huh? Head table. The head table, is that what it's called? Okay, I'll go with that because I can't get the other word in my mind, whatever it is. But anyhow, we set a table of honor, a head table, for the wedding party. And, 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 and everybody that is a part of that sets on either side of that, but right smack in the middle is the bride and the groom. And the reason that we do that 
is so that everybody that has been invited to the wedding, when they are looking forward, their focus is automatically on the bride and groom. Now, what I want you to understand, he said blessed. What's the word blessed mean? <laughs> How about uh, God's favor? Hmm. Blessed. God's grace, God's mercy. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, let me, before I go any further here, let me tell you that at this point, when this marriage supper is taking place, Jesus said, and, and, and we talk, and, and, and we kind of, I think sometimes we treat it lightly, but, but we, we talk about the communion and what it is when we do communion. But Jesus, when he took communion with his disciples, when he ate with them, when he communed with them, when he fellowshiped with them, when he had desired to eat that Passover with them, he said, with desire, I have desire to do this. And I'll not do it again until I do it afresh in my Father's kingdom. Now, what that tells me, and again, I, I spoke a while ago about the fact that I believe that the Lord has a desire for the church to be there in her fullness and in her completeness. I don't know what day that is going to be, but at that point, I can tell you that at some place, some point in time, there's going to be a communion that is going to take place during the marriage supper of the Lamb that is only going to be between the bride and the groom. I don't know how. Now, what that means is, at that moment in time, we're going to have the fullness of his fellowship. Not to be separated anymore. The, the, the completeness of all that he is will finally be revealed to the church. You see, because now we get a glimpse. How many of y'all, when God speaks to you, when you feel God's spirit in your heart, Shad told me the other day, uh, he was out in, in the truck, and he said he had a problem with the cab of the truck. It was too short, because every time he kept reaching up toward heaven, he kept slapping the top of the truck. <laughs> well, I think that's because he had a desire to reach out and get a hold of the Lord. But there are limitations to our fellowship with him now. But you've got to understand that this moment in eternity, those limitations to our fellowship, those limitations to our worship, those limitations to our praise, those limitations to our gratitude and our understanding of the magnitude of what God done, all of those things at this moment in time are lifted. They're gone. No limit anymore. I mean, if you want to just say hallelujah out loud when you get to heaven, it'd be all right. You don't got to worry about what the guy next to you is going to say. I say don't worry about what he's going to say now. <laughs> just, you know, say whoopee for Jesus. It'll be all right. But I cannot understand. I know sometimes when I get preaching and I get in my zone, you know, the one that when I'm oblivious to you all out there, and that does happen on occasion. But when I get in that place, I don't want to leave it. Because then it's almost like I have a direct connection between me and the Lord through the Spirit. And I, and I feel like the, that the Father is saying, here, preach this. And the Lord's saying, here, preach this. And the Holy Ghost is saying, here, let me help you preach that. And it just, you know, explodes. But at some point, that stops. And I come back to reality. And I go back out into the real world where there's real hurt. There's real pain. And sometimes you pray 
and you feel like it doesn't go above the ceiling. And you all probably don't never have that problem. But every now and again, there are things that get in the way, and it seemed like that when we try to fellowship with him, when we try to have that sweet communion with him, it's interrupted by life. And what I want you to understand is, this scripture says those interruptions are gone. And you get to do this for, now, I got to tell you, I'm going to say this, I know that I know that I know, some of you are going to look at me sideways. But if you don't want to praise the Lord forever, don't go to heaven. <laughs> I, hey, I think it's going to be a continual praise service when we get back. I, I mean, the angels that are created beings, the Bible says, that they are before the throne of God day and night forever and ever and they cry holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Now, here's the thing you've got to understand. He didn't do for the angels what he did for me. That one just went straight through me. And he didn't do for the angels what he did for you. So if the angels do that because he's God, how much more Will we do that because not only is he our God, but he's our Savior. And not only is he our Savior, but he's our friend. And not only is, that, is he our friend, but he's our hope. And not only that, but he's the one that's there in the wee hours of the and nobody else is there. And how in the world can you stop praising him for that when you get to heaven? So if you don't want to praise him forever, I wouldn't go to heaven. They sing a song, if, if, if you don't like shouting, don't get on a cloud with me. I think that's how the song goes. Jim could probably tell you. But here's the thing. What I want you to understand, more than anything else, if you don't get anything out of this except that, understand that when we get to heaven and the marriage supper of the Lamb has taken place, there will no longer be a limitation on our relationship with the Lord. There will not be any interruptions in that. No matter what He does, no matter where He goes, We'll be there. And, and, and by the way, once we get to this point, this next part that we're going to talk about this week and next, you don't have to worry about it because we made it. So you know what you need to do once in a while is you just need to look at your face and say, oh, when I get there, I made it. Because then, you know, no matter what, we made it. And I know some folks say, well, you know, there's this in heaven and that in heaven. Listen, if it's heaven, how bad can it be? I mean, you know, uh, if it's heaven, how, how bad can it be? So, he said, those that are called to the married supper of the Lamb are blessed indeed. And I, I got to tell you, and in case you all didn't understand this uh, the first time go around, let me tell you that all of you that are saved got an invitation to this. I, I mean, and, you know, when you look at that, you say, well, uh, no, no, yeah. Uh, we made it. So, any questions concerning that? I want you to visualize. Yes, ma'am. If the church is in Christ, then who are the rest of the people who are invited to their wedding feast? Well, there you go. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Again, understand that when we talk about the Word of God, the people of God, and the plan of God, You've got Israel, who are God's chosen people. They are the wife of God, which is another conversation altogether. Okay? Then you've got those of us that are saved, whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles, that make up the church, the bride, or now the wife. Oh, and by the way, that no longer says the bride. It says the wife. In case I forgot to point that out, that means we're married. Yeah, and uh, just in case you miss it, God don't like divorce. <laughs> uh, you'll get that when you get home. Here's the thing. Third group of people that you have are the Gentiles. Okay? Now, here, when, when we see this, we know that there are people that are in heaven that were part of 
the resurrection when Christ ascended and the grave split open. That was early on. Okay? And those that had not received the promise up to that point, but the Bible said they died having not received it, but having seen it afar off. In other words, they were looking toward Calvary and Christ as the Messiah. And so those when he preached to them that were in bondage and they came out, they went. So you got that group of people. You've got the church. And then at this particular junction in time, depending on how you believe, you've got a part of the remnant or all of the remnant of Israel that is also present here. But understand that the only people that are a part of that select group that is called the wife of the lamb is the church. The rest, uh, they're just part of the wedding party. Okay? But they, they're not a part of that little passage of scripture right there. Okay? Now, again, understand that at, at this point, we've seen the pouring out of the bowls of wrath, and we have seen uh, the judgments of God. I believe that we've seen the rapture of the church. Uh, you've got Israel that has, has fleed for a time and time and half a time into the wilderness. Uh, they're kept by God. You've got those that have been martyred uh, for the cause of Christ. So you've got several different groups of people, but there's only one group of them people that is part of the, the wife or the bride of Christ, and that's them that are the church. Got about a million questions about all them people, don't you? Well, so are, if, if you, like, so who are the people that are considered the church? Then are we the church? Yes. So if we go to church? No, no. No, we're not the church no. because we go to church. No, I mean, we are the church because we have been saved. Yes. That, yes. Okay. Yeah. See, <clears throat> the thing is, and as we get a little deeper into this scripture, It'll, it'll, it'll qualify the question that you're asking about those whose names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? When we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, our names are recorded in the Book of Life in Heaven, in the Lamb's Book. Okay? And, uh, and a little later when we talk about that book and the people that aren't in it, and the things that happen. But again, understand that all of those that have accepted Christ as their savior when the rapture happens and the church is caught out that is the bride in its completeness now here's the thing and again folks can differ on their ideologies about when the rapture of the church is going to happen but I have a hard time in my mind wrapping my thought process around the idea that he raptures the church and then more people are saved that are added to that because what that means is when then when he took the church, which is his bride, home, she was incomplete. I have a hard time with that. You see, in the Jewish custom, when the young man would choose for himself a bride, he would go back to his father's house and he would build onto father's house a dwelling place for them. He was not allowed to go and get his bride until the father said that the dwelling place was complete to the father's satisfaction and then he would sin and the bridegroom would go and fetch his bride. It's hard for me to imagine that all of this time has transpired that Christ is waiting to come and get his bride and then when he takes her, she's incomplete. Now, maybe she is. Maybe my imagination is too vivid. I just have a hard time picturing that in my mind. So, those people that are raptured because of faith in Christ and because their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that is the church. And for me, that is the people that participate in verse 7. 
Okay? Yep. We all right with that? Any other questions about that? Don't want to leave anybody out in the cold or clear as mud. All right. Here's the thing. Now, the easy way to make sure is just get saved, stay saved. When the Lord comes back, we're going. And uh, there's a, a, a premillennialist, a postmillennialist, an all-millennialist, and then there's a panillennialist. The panillennialist said it'll all pan out in the end. So, you, just you know. Made that up. Huh? You just made that up. No, I, I really didn't. I've heard it before. But here's the thing. Understand that everything, the magnitude of this is incredible. Everything that the Lord has done since the beginning of time is for this moment right here. That's incredible to me. And so to overlook it and say, no, well, you know, we made it. Yeah, but what does it mean that we made it? All of the things that I just spent 25 minutes going over. So understand that everything that Jesus taught that he was when he was talking about the church all of it is because of this and all of heaven said let us be glad and rejoice let all of heaven be glad and rejoice because God's plan of salvation is finally complete now what it means in its completeness is beyond my imagination uh, the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what God has in store for them to love Him and to serve Him. So I don't know what it's going to be like when we get there. I just know it's going to be good. So any other questions about that before I go on? Everybody's okay. All right. Verse 10. John said, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now watch. Verse 11, everything is beginning to change. I saw heaven open. Behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. Verse 12. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, this is a little different picture than what we are accustomed to. We are accustomed to the shepherd that's got the sheep on his shoulder or in his arm and he's got the staff and he's walking and he's taking the sheep back. We are accustomed to the picture of the Lord kneeling down at the rock in the garden of Gethsemane and the light coming down from heaven and everything looking so serene. And by the way, that scene of serenity was not anything like it was in the garden of Gethsemane. Just thought I'd throw that out there. That's another sermon. But here's the thing. Understand that this is not the portrait or picture of Christ that people want to see. When you see him, you want to see him as your Savior. You want to see him as your husband, as your friend, as your coming king, as your Lord. Here he is as their judge. You don't want that. Now, let me read on. It says... Verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Wonder who that is. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings. And Lord of Lords, I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, 
that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, then to set on them the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now, what I want you to understand here is what we are seeing is the Lord making preparation for the final battle between good and evil. And when we see this, let me assure you that this is not the portrait of Christ that we will see for an eternity. That, it, that is, this, he is coming to exact vengeance upon the earth, upon the beast, upon the false prophet, upon the kings of the earth, upon all of them that blaspheme the name of God. And when you see this, uh, it, it is a picture that anybody that says God is not a, a, a God that would do that, God would never send anybody to hell or God would never cause these things, His wrath be poured out upon the face of the earth because God is love. Let me tell you, this is not a portrait that they want to admit is our coming king. But it is. It is the word of God. It is king of kings, lord of lords. He is the one. The Bible said here in verse 20, the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse with the sword that proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, a couple of things I want you to note here. You know, in my reading there, we saw the armies of heaven follow him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, clean and white. But let me tell you that when it gets down to the final battle, the armies that followed him didn't do anything except follow him. Judgment came from his word. In other words, he spoke a word, and that's all that it's going to take. And when we think about that, I had a fellow ask me one time if, if I thought the Bible was literal, and I said yes. He opened his Bible to this passage of Scripture, and he says, do you think that he really has a sword sticking out of his mouth? Now, while I was young and didn't know any better, I didn't know how to answer. I said, well, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Well, what he done is he took it out of context. What I didn't realize is that that sword is the word of God. And it is the word of God that he will use. And he will speak a word. And in a word, the beast and the false prophet and all them that followed him be consumed in a minute. In a moment, everything changes. That is how powerful the word of our God is. Now, whoo! I don't know if I want to get into chapter 20 tonight or not. Let me stop. Let me ask you. Have you got any questions about what I just read or what I just said? Because some of y'all are looking at me a little perplexed. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, this might be a bit of a rabbit trail, but do you think the marriage ceremony will follow essentially the Jewish wedding ceremony? Yes, I do. That's very prophetic. Yes, I think it will. And, and that is, you know, not only do I think that the ceremony, ceremony will follow that, but I also think that the Lord is following that same thing when he said, I'm going back to my father's house and I'm going to build a place or prepare a place. And when it's done and the father says for me to come, and that's why he told his disciples, nobody knows the time except my father. I don't even know when it is. So I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, whatever it is. And when... It's all done. The Father says, go get him. I'm going to go fetch him. But yes, I do think that it is going to follow the Jewish ceremony. I think the Jewish customs are going to be involved there. And uh, that, and uh, again, that's one of the reasons why that, that I think that when we look at the idea that the marriage of the Lamb has come and, and that the wife has made herself ready, that, that that is the culmination of all things of the plan of salvation of God. Everything that Christ lived for, died for, rose for, and has done since is for that moment of time. And I just don't think we ought to just gloss over it like, oh, well, we made it. And, yeah. And the sevens match up then because the seven, if it's pre-trib, which is the 
which I hope it is. Uh, then I hope you're the, right. The, the, seven, the seven days that the bride and groom go off to themselves, uh -huh. the, the seven years of the tribulation that uh -huh. we're up in the mezzanine. Yes. The ceremony. Yes. And that is uh, in Isaiah, and I think it's in chapter 26, it talks about enter thou into thy chamber and, and close the doors until the time of the indignation is passed. Yeah. And that word indignation there is wrath. And uh, so I hope uh, that right to the letter that works because uh, then that would indicate that the church would be out of here. And, and, I, and I hope that the pre-tribulationists are right. I hope they are. And somebody explain the, the Jewish wedding ceremony question. Like she was saying that the you know, the, the groom goes back to the father's house to prepare their living quarters. Uh -huh. So the father says, yes, it's good. Right. And he goes and gets the bride and brings her back. And then they get locked away for seven days? No, after the ceremony. I say there's, I say there's a celebration, <laughs> the ceremony, and, and then the bride and the groom separate themselves and they will be, and again, I don't know in this particular instance, uh, whether or not it will be to the letter. If it is, then what Sister Pat is talking about as far as the, the seventh lining up and the fact that, that they generally remove themselves for a week of, of being alone time. Um, Basically, we call that our honeymoon. Right? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. But the, the party supposedly continues. Yeah, oh yeah, the celebration until they come back, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, but... When I read, I'm not sure that the tribulation period is going to be seven years of celebration, no. although it could be in glory. So, but, um, you know, at some point, sis, and of course, I don't know at what point, because I know that we have a limited time with you all now, uh, but at some point it would be interesting to spend a, an evening just on those customs and how they fit. Yeah, I've got a DVD. I'll, I'll see if we can... Put all that together. I don't know when, but yeah. Okay. Any other questions about what we read, what we said? Um, nobody's got any. Okay. So here's the thing. I want. I, I, I would like you to do. Um, I, I want you to just think about um, what we read tonight and about the the wedding ceremony slash celebration the worship service that's going to take place in heaven and uh, when you realize what had to happen to get us to this point it'll change it, it'll if you let it it'll blow the top off your mind I mean it really will because uh, I see the the countless dollars and times and energies that are spent in weddings here that normally last. Uh, we, we had a, a young couple get married here on December the 18th, and uh, they just used the church, and their pastor actually did the wedding. And the young woman, when it, I, I got here when it was over to help them take it down and get the church put back together, and the young woman said this to me. But I, I told her, I said, you're, you're just absolutely a beautiful bride. And she looked at me and she said, I thought it was going to last longer than that. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, they don't. Unless, of course, it's a Catholic wedding. I've never been to one of them. They tell me they're longer. They are longer. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's long? Yeah. But here's the thing I want you all to understand. Um, we put countless dollars, hours, energy into weddings here that at very best are temporary. But if you look what God put, what God invested into this one, the price that was paid for this marriage supper to take place was incredible. It'll boggle your mind. Now, maybe it won't. You all might be able to read it and dismiss it and go, ah, okay, I can't. Because it just absolutely, it, it, 
Ela é boa, ela gosta de banana. Yeah.